Good day, everyone. I'm Alex here from The Green Left Show. Today, I'm here with Sue Bolton, Mary Becker Councillor on Human Rights is Council Business. As always, this show is being recorded on stolen First Nations land, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also, if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. It's the number one way to receive the content that we produce as well as to support our work. Plans start from just $5 a month. There is a uh, link in the video description or at the podcast or else find out more at greenlift.org.au. So I'm here with uh, Sue Bolton who's a Mary Beck councillor and Socialist Alliance member and Sue is actually the person that moved the motions at Mary Beck Council in favour of Palestine and the boycott, divestment and sanctions um, actions that Mary Beck has taken. Uh, but there's obviously a certain amount of controversy. Labor wants, uh, Labor says that council should focus on narrowly defined uh, local issues uh, which is summed up in the catchphrase, you know, uh, roads, rates and rubbish. Um, but you, I guess, are putting forward a broader view, a broader idea that um, council should be concerned about human rights. So can you explain why that, what that means and why that is? Well, you could say councils uh, are concerned about roads, rates, rubbish and rights. That would be another way of saying it, because councils are concerned with a lot of issues you know, they provide maternal and child health services, they provide parks, they provide libraries. In the past, they used to provide childcare itself. Um, unfortunately, a lot of councils have privatised that. They provide aged care in the home. Um, they've, you know, involved in various social programs, as well as roads, rates and rubbish. And when you actually look at it, a lot of these issues, roads, rates and rubbish, council is not entirely responsible for. State government in Victoria sets the rates um, or the rates limit um, and also um, rubbish uh, some elements of the waste collection services. The policy is set by state government. So the state government's introduced a four bin service or at least got all councils to introduce a forbidden service. So some of it, some things that council does is within the bounds of legislation, state government legislation, um, and state government le has a lot of control over what councils do and don't do. But councils also have forever had an involvement with um, issues that are important in the community that might not immediately be seen as being local government business. For example, I'm sure during the Second World War that local councils would have had positions opposing the Nazi occupation um, in Europe. Um, you know, this was a worldwide phenomenon of opposition to Nazism, opposition to fascism in Germany. Um, and so I'm sure there would have been those positions. Going back to the 50s and 60s, there were positions of councils um, to ban the bomb when nuclear weapons became a thing. And certainly during the 80s, I'm very aware that a lot of councils became nuclear free zones um, in opposition to nuclear weapons and nuclear energy and nu radioactive waste. Um, more recently, um, in the um, late 90s, after the massacres in East Timor, after East Timor is voted for independence, um, councils all over Australia responded to a massive movement all over Australia to support East Timor. Um, and that was also partly because of the links with the Second World War. There were some people who were maybe normally conservative on a lot of social issues who supported the East Timorese because of um, how the East Timorese took care of Australian soldiers during the Second World War. And some of the old um, diggers felt they had a responsibility, they owed something back to the East Timorese. So still today, a lot of councils all over the country have, um, have friendship groups with villages in East Timor. Um, I know Meribek and Hume councils have one. There's ones on the Mornington Peninsula, not just inner city councils, all sorts of councils, including some rural ones. But then also councils have historically taken positions in support of different parts of the community, refugees, queer community, um, 
uh, various migrant communities um, in support of First Nations uh, people. Um, councils have taken social justice stands because all of these people exist within our communities. We've got library books in different languages. We've got um, story time for children in, for different communities, like in Faulkner has an Urdu story time. There's still Greek story times. Um, there are ne Nepalese story times for young children um, because there's a recognition that if children learn their mother language and um, can read in their, in their own language, then that creates really good connections for children and lays a good base for language acquisition, especially growing up in an English-speaking society. So there are lots of things that councils are involved in and I think there was nothing out of the ordinary of moving a motion calling for an end to the genocide in Gaza and for council to stop uh, entering contracts with and buying from companies that support the Israeli military and the genocide in Gaza. There's a few things I like to um, just, uh, I guess, get your response to. I mean, one is the question of double standards. So there's a lot of conservatives might be quite happy to pass a, for local governments and, and also medical organisations and academic organisations to pass motions against the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but they're very concerned about taking a stand on Palestine. Like, can you talk about that double yes. standards? So there is... A yeah, there, I mean, there were some local councils and certainly state government, federal government immediately came out and condemned um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainian colours were beamed up onto the Opera House and various town hall buildings and so forth. And yeah, so there was an immediate response by a lot of councils and, you know, opposition to the invasion, which, you know, was a terrible invasion. Um, war is terrible for working class people and you know it's working class people who suffer the most from any war but then some of those same people were absolutely opposed to um, any kind of recognition of the atrocities being committed against the Palestinians and in fact actually some of those same organizations the same councils immediately lit up uh, public buildings with Israeli colors and and they also took advantage of the fact that there are a lot of people in Australia who don't know very much about the history of Palestine and the Israeli occupation of Palestine. So they tried to take advantage of that for people to um, try and sympathise with the country's military and political elite that are responsible for the oppression and repression of Palestinians. Related to that double standards, I think sometimes also there's a case of a, of debating the process rather than the politics. So conservatives who don't agree with a pro-Palestine stand will complain about the process of a local government taking a stand on it rather than actually having the honesty to actually to put their, their pro-genocidal or pro-Israel point of view. There is true that um, some of the Zionists uh, people in the community have, or Zionists who've been attacking councils for taking positions in support of Palestine, have criticised councils for not having a referendum first before adopting a position. That's something which has been raised with me. Um, and so, yeah, it's true, some of them have basically focused on that. Some Zionist organisations and individuals also say, ah, oh, well, you're not taking up other international issues, you're only taking up Palestine. And the local federal Labor MP, Peter Khalil, says that. He says, oh, you're not at, um, talking about the situation of the Rohingya or the Sudanese. Now, that's interesting that he says that. I mean, A, you can't physically take up every injustice all over the world. But B, um, the government has left Rohingya refugees in the lurch. This, the world has left Rohingya refugees in the lurch. A lot of people who are protesting around Palestine have raised our voices and been at protests uh, in support of Rohingya refugees and in support of the Sudanese community. And I know in the case of Sudan, the Australian government has still not called for a ceasefire. Um, it's a horrible situation for people in Sudan. 
And you can look at the Palestine Solidarity Movement and the Solidarity Movement has been inviting people onto its platform from representing lots of different struggles. The Black Africans for Palestine, they've invited um, West Papuan activists, they've invited activists from um, who support the Kanak struggle, they've invited activists from a range of different backgrounds to talk about the situation in their country, which is a product of colonialism and so forth. So it's a really rubbish argument. One thing also, I guess, I think it's important to note that local residents uh, care about and are affected by big international issues. And I guess like just um, you know, close to my heart, I mean, where I'm from in Brisbane just last week, um, the, the Liberal National Party dominated council passed a motion uh, requesting that the Greens councillor, Trina Massey, repay $20,000 for a council newsletter, which had been through all of the official council approval processes. It literally told the story of a local resident in Brisbane, in her ward, um, who had to flee his home in, in Palestine in 1948 um, in the face of the Zionist eth ethnic cleansing. Are there things that you would like to say about like you know, local residents who have their own personal stories or their own personal cares and aspirations and desires about you know human rights issues? I think there are lots of local residents like that. Um, both people with ties to the region and people who have no ties to the region but are just horrified when they look at their social media streams and look at the news and can see that nothing justifies what Israel's doing to Gaza. It's so ghastly what's happening and people in Gaza can't escape that reality. And there are lots of people in the uh, Mirabek community as well as other communities who have suffered a lot of family members and in some cases friends who've been killed in Israeli airstrikes or killed as a result of Israel stopping medical aid or, and water and food and so forth getting into Gaza. So um, people are suffering. I don't know how Palestinians go to work and study every day when this is happening, especially any Palestinians who've got ties to close ties to Palestine, where they've got family members and friends over there, um, especially in Gaza, but also West Bank, is that Israel has taken the war to West Bank and is, you know, killing unarmed civilians in West Bank as well. So, yeah, and I met a woman, I met her in the Meribek area, but she actually came from Broadmeadows, and she, this is in November or December last year, she had lost 120 members of her family. And so that has an impact in the local area and in terms of council services um, because people are suffering deep grief. People are suffering anger. They're feeling deep grief. Some people might even be suicidal. Some people feel guilty by the fact that they're able to have three meals a day in Australia, but their relatives are eating grass and leaves and cooking up leaf soup and so forth. So yeah, this is, is so in that sense, this isn't just an international issue. It's an issue that has reverberates within communities right across the world, including our local communities here. And it would be the case even in some of the regional, regional communities, not just in the inner urban communities. Can you talk about the connection between uh, struggling for justice on big international issues and struggling for justice at local level? Well, I think um, anyone who doesn't support standing up against injustice, especially standing up against a genocide, an actual genocide, which Australian government is helping be perpetuated by providing weaponry to Israel and all... and state government in Victoria has got a, got a contract with an Israeli weapons company um, and local councils are also buying equipment and goods from companies that provide support to the Israeli military and the genocide in Gaza. So the links are there. And so anyone who's not 
moved by and opposed to the genocide in Gaza is likely, not automatically, but likely to be someone who's likely to be dismissive of local people's concerns. And you can see councillors and councils disregarding the rights of homeless people. I know I've been involved in battles like that where the council's been putting in what they call aggressive architecture to um, install um, armrests on bench seats to make sure that people can't lie down, for example, if they're sleeping rough. And I think having a humanitarian approach on an international issue um, is a good guide to having a humanitarian approach on local issues, which might even be battling the council. And you're more likely to recognise the human rights of ordinary everyday people, including people who are struggling economically, if you also recognise an injustice like what's happening to the Palestinians in Gaza right now doesn't automatically guarantee that, but it, I would say in the majority of cases, because there are many people who will have a hard-hearted attitude on a broader social justice issue, and that hard-hearted attitude carries across to basic issues and that affect people, um, which might also include things like councils trying to sneakily close an outdoor swimming pool or do other things behind the backs of the local community. So you've uh, served three terms on the Marybeck Council so far, and you're now contesting for a fourth term. Can you talk about your record, both at you know the sort of quote-unquote local issues plus the broader human rights issues? Well, I think the way I've approached being on council is a little bit like being a union delegate. If there's an issue that affects just a single person or a couple of people, then you'll try and do your best to advocate to council officers um, what the concerns of people are or why people feel like they've been treated unjustly. But if it's an issue that affects a range of people in the community that's like they have broader impact on other people, then I always encourage people to come together, to organise, to put forward their voice about that particular issue. Because what I want to get is wins for the community not just to go to a council meeting and vote for or against something that's in the interest of the community and, and then lose the issue and say, I'm a hero because I voted this way. I don't see much point in that. I want to actually win things for the community. And usually if the bureaucrats aren't listening to the community and the other councillors are not listening to the community, then the community needs to put its voice forward now, in the inner city areas, like in Mirabek's case, that's Brunswick, there are quite a few residence action groups on or community action groups on this or that issue. And the community is quite good at advocating for themselves. Um, but as you go further north to the poorer parts of Mirabek, you see there's less and less community activism. So a lot of people in the north get treated for granted. Um, and part of it, some people have got multi, you know, multi jobs that they're juggling, so they don't have as much time or resources. They're not as well healed to be involved in campaigns around issues. So I go out and I encourage people to take up a petition first to, you know, talk to people to get a sense of whether other people are upset about this particular issue. And then, you know, if people are sort of upset about this issue, then we see if people want to have a get together for a community meeting. Um, so maybe you might organise a community group meeting. You might organise a group, a proper group with a name, or maybe you might just go from that community meeting to start to go to council meetings to raise your questions and concerns. And there are issues where we've, you know, have created full-on campaigns. And so I see myself as not just speaking on behalf of a campaign in council, but helping people exercise their own voice and counsel and using that little tiny bit of democracy that they keep trying to take away on counsel where people can come and either ask questions or make statements before a council, at the beginning of a council meeting. And then I'm also advocating in council, but it's much better if people are coming to council and speaking in their own voice 
representing their own community because I'll communicate extra things that I might not be able to express because I haven't experienced that particular issue. And, and also contacting all of the councillors, um, not just their ward councillors. And on that basis, that's how we saved the Faulkner Outdoor Pool. Even though it was lockdown and COVID in 2021, we managed to save the Faulkner Outdoor Swimming Pool. And we basically, the community, we petitioned. I think council bureaucrats were very upset with us for petitioning because they wanted to clo want to close down outdoor pools. Um, but we think there was good evidence as to why you needed to keep the outdoor swimming pool in Faulkner. And we, we petitioned, we had a protest on the shortest day of the year uh, or the coldest day of the year in between lockdowns and so forth. It was really successful. Um, we, you know, contacted all the councillors. We, you know, had people sp speaking in council meetings. And in the end, we managed to succeed in winning over all of the councillors to a unanimous decision. But if we hadn't have built a campaign, it would have just been me voting against the closure of the Faulkner Outdoor Pool. Um, and I would have lost. We would have lost the outdoor pool or maybe me and a couple of others. But instead, we actually built a campaign and we won. And are there any other issues? Oh, there's other issues like with this toxic site in Faulkner where Agent Orange was, um, was uh, manufactured in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, as well as other dangerous chemicals. Um, you know, it was very dangerous. Um, it was across the road from houses. People couldn't grow plants in their gardens. The paint on their fences peeled off as a result of the toxins. The foul smell was foul, so there were 2 a.m. protests outside the factory gates. And there was a cancer cluster, which there's evidence of. The site was cleaned up, but not properly cleaned up. Uh, early days of um, environmental audits, and it was a very dirty environmental audit, which really needs to be redone again. And the, there was a permit application to build on that toxic site. Uh, luckily, only warehouse, not housing, but still work. That means real live workers are working on that site. And we um, built, I thought, surely this won't go through council. I moved a motion that before any um, permits were voted on by council, there should be a new environmental audit. And I was accused of being hysterical and frightening mothers and babies. And, and you know, m all of the other councillors were really against me. Um, even the Greens were upset that I'd, you know, um, was scaremongering about this. In the end, the Greens supported the motion for um, there to be an environmental audit of the site, but they were not, um, they sort of bought into the criticism that I was scaremongering about this. But I'm old enough to remember the, um, the 70s when um, returned, uh, you know, soldiers from, Viet, from Australia's invasion of Vietnam came back and had all sorts of health problems as a result of exposure to Agent Orange. Uh, let alone the birth defects in Vietnam as a result of the community being sprayed with tons and tons and tons of Agent Orange. And so we had to campaign against, we had to get technical advice. Um, we had to build up our technical advice. We built a community campaign, we petitioned, we spoke in council meetings. But one of the very scary things was that when it was the older working class residents who were very cynical about politicians and councillors and were angry about the history of this site and the cancer clusters of the past and, and possibly even currently, they um, the other councillors just put their fingers in their ears and said, oh, there's just angry residents. We're not going to listen to them. It wasn't until the university educated residents who knew how to structure an argument started speaking out that some of those other councillors listen to the concerns of the community, which is really outrageous. Um, you're not always going to have those university educated people in every community to, you know, speak in a, in a well-regulated university structured style. 
to put forward a case. Sometimes there will be angry people and you've got to look below the anger to understand what um, what the issue is. Uh, but in the end, we won over all the other councillors to unanimous vote against that development. And so that was a win. We lost it at VCAT when the Environmental Unprotection Agency uh, was on the developer's side, which is really quite outrageous. And I think that's because they didn't want to open up all of these environmental audits uh, because there would be lots of dodgy audits like this one. Uh, which are highly contaminated sites that have been approved for development of, the, of this or that. So, um, but if we hadn't have had that campaign, I would have been the only councillor opposing that development. And it's still a highly toxic site underneath the clay cap. And finally, um, there, I understand there is a debate in the Muslim community in Faulkner about who to vote for, because your main rival is a Labour Party candidate who is Muslim. Uh, but he's he's Muslim, but he's also representing a pro-genocide party. On the other hand, you're not Muslim, but you are against the genocide in Palestine, and you have supported the democratic rights of the of the local Muslim community. And this is re resulting in a debate about who to vote for among among that community. Can you talk about that debate? Well, I think it is really interesting because I think the whole Palestine movement, the shock, how shocking the the genocide is in Gaza. And the fact that this movement has kept mobilising for over 11 months now, it's outright outlandish that Israel's been able to get away with this genocide for over 11 months. And that has really politicised a lot of people, opened people's eyes to, a lot of people's eyes to the structure of politics and society. And people can also see the unequal treatment, like the government's, immediately implemented sanctions against Ukraine, not a single sanction against Israel. And so people sort of drawing the conclusions that governments are uh, concerned about the human rights of white people, but not of brown people or people from the global south. So the, the fact that this Palestine movement has mobilized solidly for over 11 months has and people can see for the, with their own eyes that the, how the Australian government and other Western governments responded to the invasion of Ukraine, but haven't lifted a finger to help people in Gaza, haven't implemented a single sanction against Israel, despite the most horrendous genocide. And this has opened the eyes of so many people in society, people including within the Muslim community, as well as anyone whose heart has been touched by what's happening in Gaza. And in the Muslim community, I think it's there has been a real reawakening because, you know, often in the past, a lot of people in a lot of migrant organisations, especially uh, more recently arrived migrant communities and the Muslim community often feel very vulnerable because there is a lot of racism in Australia. And so they often like to invite politicians to all of their events, even sometimes invite the police to their events because they want to be seen as responsible members of the society so that they can try and, you know, stave off racism and, and, and get things for their communities. And this time, starting in November, December, the Muslim community or sections of the Muslim community have started to say, we're not going to be photo ops for politicians anymore. We're not going to be their backdrop for photo ops and then be stabbed in the back um, by, you know, the government supporting the genocide in Palestine um, and refuse to do anything about the genocide. So there's been a a really heartening response from the, within the Muslim community. Um, and, you know, that's involved big debates in the Muslim community, including the, um, the in, in Melbourne, the whole struggle to boycott the Premier's iftar dinner, which was a grassroots revolt by the Muslim community. And no doubt there were some Muslim organisations that wanted to attend because they wanted to shore up funding from the state government for various projects. 
but the grassroots of the community rose up and said, no, you're going to boycott this. Um, and they forced um, the organisations to sign on to letters saying they were going to boycott this. And this is quite amazing because often these communities feel that they have to be super grateful for every little thing that governments or, or politicians do for them. Um, and even when politicians don't do anything for them, they still feel that they have to be very polite and, and nice to the politicians. And so this was a rebellion. And this means that the Labor Party, I mean, because it's mostly Labor seats affected, the Labor Party can't take the Muslim community for granted any longer. And so there is a debate in lots of communities, including Meribek, the ward in particular that I'm standing in, which has something like 25% of the community is Muslim, mostly from South Asia. Um, and it's led to big debates about, um, about who to vote for. And of course, the major parties are playing the identity card of pre-selecting Muslims um, for, as candidates. And the Labor Party has pre-selected uh, Pakistani Muslim candidate um, for, the seat, for the ward that includes Faulkner. He works part-time for the state Labor MP. And so he's very involved in the whole ALP career path. And he said in November, December last year, he said to me on more than one occasion, oh yes, it's very sad what's happening in Gaza, but there's nothing we can do. It's a federal issue, not a state issue. This is despite the fact that state government's got deals with Israeli weapons company. And so he's never shown the slightest bit of concern about Palestine. And so now there's a debate in the, um, within the Muslim community about who you're going to support, whether you're, supporting, you're going to support people who've supported Palestine and supported the Muslim community, or if you're going to vote just on the basis that uh, someone is Muslim. And I think people are becoming very politically aware. Now, that doesn't mean I'll win. It's going to, the ALP has long arms and they're trying to dangle funding in front of um, different organisations, sports groups, migrant groups, etc. But there's a debate happening within the community because of what's happening in Palestine. So it'll be very interesting to see what the outcome of all of this is. But certainly the ALP is trying to win away more conservative parts of that community to try and scare people about voting for me. But there are a lot of people in the Muslim community who are wanting um, pro-Palestine candidates to win. And they're openly barracking for pro-Palestine candidates against Muslim candidates that Labor and Liberal are putting up um, just for show. Thanks everyone for joining us today. That brings us to the end of the Green Nef Show. Thank you, Sue, for your time. And also thank you, everyone, for joining us. As I said at the beginning, if you like the work that we do, please do become a Green Nef supporter if you're not already. And uh, we will see you next time on the Green Nef Show. Thank you.